how do uh, how and when did you come to United States? I escaped from Vietnam, uh, just like many Vietnamese people, um, as a work person. Um, so 31 years already, my journey all the way back when I was 19 or 20. Father, can you tell uh, about a little detail about your trip? your journey to the United States, what happened? As a young man grew up in Saigon, um, escape for us is just like a party to go further, to be able to continue with my education or just to, to sum up to be able to continue to study, become a priest. Uh, I was the uh, student for Salesian de Moscow in Vietnam at the age of 13 and a half, or uh, basically younger than that. But uh, um, so when the communists took over the South in 1975, we were not allowed to live together as a group of young men. So they asked us to go home or kick us out from the campus. So my parents always had the vision that my older brother would become an engineering and I would become a priest. And uh, that is their dream and also is my happiness. But later on I found out more so that the happiness within, within serving the Catholic Church, um, the more I serve, the more I find the energy for the happiness to uh, glorify God's name. So the escape is a part of that to be able to continue to study, to become a priest. Um, nobody knew that I will return to the seminary, um, but be able to settle in the United States and to be uh, welcome in this wonderful country that allow me to be able to uh, follow uh, up my dream or my vocation. It was a very, very uh, tough journey. Uh, we were on the sea for seven days and six nights. Um, I believe, at a young age of 19, uh, I count we've been attacked by tides, pirates and tides, um, fishermen for 22 times. Um, so fortunately, two times, uh, I believe that been attacked or captured by the Thai fishermen or uh, pirates. Because they are sometimes the fishermen, sometimes they are rude people with weapons and with the way they do in the sea. Um, before even that two, 22 times, we've been robbed by the communist government at the international water, they shoot at us and they stop us. And the captain at that time asked us to collect all the jewelry, the gold, the money, whatever, that we can exchange our freedom. And we did. Uh, the whole head, his head, the captain head, with jewelry, watches, gold, money, and they let us go. And from there, I still remember the first uh, capture by the Thai fishermen or pirates that they took the, um, the major part of the engine and whatever they can grab. Um, so we floated on the water. That's why seven days and six nights in the sea. Uh, of course, escape, you don't plan enough, enough water or enough food. So with our food and water as well. Uh, it was a very unusual uh, for me to observe. I, I consider I'm a very uh, well-built big man um, in the boat, but I was the first one threw up. <laughs> a city boy, so I never be able to get used to the sea and how be able to handle the sea. Did not know anything about water, the sea, or swimming either. Um, 
there are many many stories that in that trip were basically uh, seven days and six um, six nights and when the um, when we be able to feel that we've been saved by the um, Thai government because the navy ship stopped it. Um, but somehow they tied us from the big ship, the little boat, 67 people and they pulled us with a very high speed. And later on I understood that they tried to sink us uh, because with that speed, with the big ship and small boat, the small boat tend to uh, sink. One of the gentlemen uh, in the boat uh, volunteered to climb on the rope and cut it with a sharp object. And but he requested, but if he drowned, we, the people who survived, if we survived, uh, to promise to take care of his children. Of course, everybody said we will. I, I'm still wondering or still question. What if he drowned? What if we survive? Who are the people who really kept that promise? That's, that's a, a heroic uh, sacrificial for that gentleman to be able to do it. Well, in the uh, grace of God, uh, we be able to survive after they pull us from the Thai water to Malaysia and they did drop us for a few miles from. Again, uh, I did heard one of the fishermen said, uh, there's little wave, the, the white color of the waves, which means very, very close to the shore. People want to jump down and swim, people want to paddle to get in. Uh, I stood there and don't understand how can we able to reach to the land you know, after six nights and seven days, and uh, city boy didn't know much about water, uh, but somehow we managed with hand pedals, uh, with the wind from God, we we'll be able to make it to the shore of Malaysia, and uh, we landed to the unknown island. Uh, Malaysian village people called the local officers and the United Nations came and they took us to the uh, temporary um, came and then bring us to Polobidom Island and where I stayed there for four months and a half and one month and a half in Kuala Lumpur um, the capital of the census camp in Malaysia and then united with my older brother who came here a year before me uh, who landed in Indonesia um, arrived to Texas and came to California so I came here in November 7th 1980 you know what is my first Christmas song? yes what is my first Christmas song that I learned in the United States? Why Christmas? Moment, Why Christmas? Almost close because I came in November seventh uh, in television. They keep singing. Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Oh, they almost close. Yeah. One more guess. Jingle Bell. Jingle Bell. Jingle Bell. Yeah. Very close. But my first English Christmas song I learned was uh, "Merry Christmas from Payless." Merry Christmas. Because there's in TV they keep singing that song. 24 hours a day. <laughs> I thought it's a new Christmas song, but it's a commercial. That's a commercial. <laughs> That's how I uh, experienced uh, first Christmas in the United States. You already commercialized uh, I did not know much about. Just don't know. Did not know how to speak English. Did not uh, know what to do and the paper process. Uh, Christmas Thanksgiving spirit people hurry up and travel so the uh, government office they just hang on and to do what they can do so November 7th 1980 I came to the United States what went to your mind at that time you, you came from 
a very rundown country under control of communists. Now you came to a country uh, that, uh, you know, one of the uh, strongest country and then you have freedom. What went to your mind at that time on your first Christmas? I value the freedom. The word freedom for me is so valuable or very important for me to my family, at least for me to my family at that time. Because my brother tried to escape at least six times. Before my brother be able to escape, I was the chosen one from my parents that to leave the country in 1976. My older brother and I only two boys in the family. Uh, my parents already set up that we can leave on the day of April 30th, uh, the Black April. Uh, but somehow my uncle, who is in the Navy, could not be able to cross the bridge and, and, and take us along to go. So many times try to escape and many times I try not to participate in the, we call meetings, we call whatever they do uh, at the early years under the communist. Um, I'm always in the blacklist, even though it's a young age, because my father was in the Red Cross Army for more than 21 years. Uh, we always in the military parish, military base. Um, so, to be able to escape, to be able to come to the place that continue with my education, to be able to to fight for the cause, oh, for me the freedom. The two words that still meant too much for me, to my family, until now, I still very value that. Father, can I ask you what happened to your Don Bosco Seminary School? At a young age, Oh, enter at the age of maybe 12 and 13. Uh, when the communists took over the... They did not allow um, young men to gather as a large group. So Salesian, the Moscow in Govap, there's a one very big institution, a technical school. So therefore, they took, um, they took over the school. Uh, all, the most of the Suhun um, or the brothers uh, encouraged to return home or to return home mean to go back to their civilian life, get married. What's a funny story, I still remember at the age of uh, 15, I believe. They gathered us back a few times and one time they asked us to uh, sign the paper that Tu Tai Ya mean to be a seminarians at home and we we so zeal to serve God so I believe that I have the paper in my hand and willing to sign but I heard later the brothers whom asked us to do so left and get married <laughs> so I said forget it <laughs> so uh, yeah they took over the school the institution um, Whomever, I don't know the happened to them, uh, they scattered. So they condemn all the assets of the institution? Oh yes, indeed. All the institution, as you know, uh, not only Salesian to Moscow, but uh, almost all the institution in the north and south, wherever they can have their hands on. Until now, many institutions have returned back to the Catholic Church. If they do now, they do one third, 50 50, whatever the deal they make, and who knows. But what happened to the elder priests? Um, you know, they cannot go home because simply they were away from their family for a long time, and also many, their family not no longer there to return to. You know, what happened to them? I don't know much. If we go back to the United States, what happened to your transition to back to school and become a priest? Um, how difficult for a young um, Vietnamese um, seminary uh, come here and uh, you know, learn and uh, to be ordained as a priest? For the first uh, year, go back to the after two days in the United States, I already 
uh, find the means to study English in the ESL program, which means have Saturday, Sunday, Monday, find the means to study English. Um, to be able to study to become a priest uh, was an impossible dream for, for me, particularly, uh, because one have to face the new culture, new customs, new ways of life, thinking about one will serve the English-speaking parish in the future and stand on the pulpit to preach in English always oh, is the scary thought. Um, but no matter what, the scary thoughts in my mind and try to study day and night, uh, even though I came from uh, the education at the student selection, the Moscow school study English, huh? even though I study Yin Hong English school in Saigon, doesn't mean anything. Uh, I have to brainwash myself first, I have to be brainwash myself uh, so that I can learn from the beginning ABC. No shame to say I don't speak English. And second, to be able to do that, I have to set up my philosophy to say yes to life. To uh, say yes to life. Later on, I, I wrote the longer articles, but just to, just to say yes. To be able to study day and night, to be able to uh, find the means, any good technique that I can grab home, have my hands on, and to hear and afford. For example, I heard that uh, you can study during your sleep. And uh, I turn on the English tape and let them just your mind, your body rest, but your mind still working. Uh, if I can be able to find any English speaking person be able, willing to teach, I learn. I learn how to speak in public, learn how to uh, speak out loud in public, learn how, how to I do. So, um, talking about English is a major part. Even though uh, I still remember when in second year theology, which means after uh, five years in college, one year study English and four years get degree, and two years theology, I still request to go to learn uh, English uh, in the specialist school for the people who cannot speak English, or people who cannot speak, period. So I have no how to put my tongue and open my mouth. Because Vietnamese gentlemen don't, when I speak, they don't open the mouth. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the extreme. To extreme. Because of my example, willing to learn some other seminarians later on, the dioceses or the professors at the seminaries forced them to do the same. They hated me so much. I said, because of you, Guang. We have to go through many programs. <laughs> but I said, well, we prepare for the future. We are not prepare just to survive. Today, when you preach in front of Vietnamese uh, uh, parishioner and English parishioner, how difficult is that for you? You original from Vietnamese, but you study to death to, uh, to be able to, I mean, uh, present a speech in English. How difficult now? What a different and also. Totally different. Um, I remember after 10 years training, uh, learning the ways of life and everything in English. Preaching is still a major part of one has to improve every day. Uh, by the way, I haven't spoke English for almost a year and a half now huh? because I'm here with the Vietnamese parish community. Everything is Vietnamese. Okay. Uh, so my English is uh, I have a holy accent so far. <laughs> uh, but um, before I came here, I preach easier for me to preach in English because every day, no fail for 21 years, I prepare to preach, never give up a day. Sometimes my day off, different story. But because of that, preaching in English become a second nature short along. Uh, when I came here, 
uh, it, Vietnamese is not the difficult part for me to preach because I always work with Vietnamese um, communities since my ordination. But when I ordained in 1991, uh, after 10 years uh, heavy training everything in English, I have to read almost 200 books in Vietnamese to catch up with my Vietnamese my first year. And uh, I consider I'm uh, average to be able to survive, but uh, it was very, uh, very interesting. Now, uh, every day is in Vietnamese. So it's a little reverse for say, one year and seven months now. It, it's been fun. How big was uh, Oakland Diocese before you come here? How? Well, how Oakland Diocese is big. Its population is uh, half a million Catholic people. Uh, they have 88 parishes. Uh, I was be able to pivot to serve them as the associate and then became pastors and uh, became director uh, of merging and building the cathedral and then became and moving into the new cathedral for one year and a half, basically working for that um, position for almost six years. It was a significant achievement of you and why, why you were a pastor of um, uh, that diocese. Can you tell about how you be able to gather people, fundraise and build that cathedral? Or mm. oh, to build the cathedral is not I to build the diocese. I'm just to be humbly and privileged to be a part of that. Uh, when they appointed me as the rector at the cathedral, I talked to the Vicar General, now is the Bishop Lewis Silva in Honolulu, Hawaii. I said, I don't know anything about working or uh, burning cathedral. He said, who knows? Who knows more than you? Or who knows who can claim that no more than you? By the grace of God, which is do and do from the heart. Um, yeah, the the total package of the cathedral center is one hundred eighty-two million dollars. Uh, they divide it to the cathedrals, the land, and the part of that. Uh, I think it's about up to 90, but the whole complex center they call with the changery, with the gift shops, with the convention, with all that $182 million. I think be a part of that. How long did it take to build that, uh, that cathedral? Oh, the process had to go back before three years to build. Um, I was in the architectural design committee for three years just to find the, the other tech to build and then from there uh, three years plus so three years to build planning three years not to plan in two years to build uh, three years is by planning and tech and in the process of that a zillion meetings um, yeah I have learned so much learned a lot uh, again I'm just being part of the bigger picture that um, but I think building a cathedral is easier than to build a community, to build uh, the people who are willing to serve God, the people willing to glorify God's name and do the right thing. Building the community is much harder. For example? Uh, for example, uh, right now I'm have a very hum very humble chapel um, only up to 40 people for each mass the collection is um, like to this week I just told them that we have a very low collection 26 hundreds but the people are so great now you see they're working outside in the sun 108 degree in Las Vegas not only a day but every day just to build the uh, station for San Joseph status and for Pieta and prepare for the convention in October. Uh, they're willing to give their times, their talents, their treasure uh, without any 
rewarding our payment. Uh, I think the, the previous pastor for the Joseph Trump have done a good job and I continue to enhance it. Um, but that building a community that are willing to serve and serve uh, without any agenda or beneficial for them is um, it's easy to hire 20 staff people pay to do the job and it is again it's still their vocation to serve they need to survive bring the bread and um, bring home for the children the family but here uh, I have no staff you look at it for the Joseph Trong, the previous pastor said one man there. I, I don't say that, but they have a lot of people working together, but they don't get paid or we don't pay them because we can't afford it. What is the magic, uh, uh They have to see the leader or the pastor serve from the heart. They have to see that. And uh, they need to see that you also travel or um, companion with them in every steps. When we do something, I don't, I don't sit in the office most of the time. I roll my sleeves out there with them. Uh, Father, um, can you uh, uh, tell about the number of the Vietnamese priests uh, serving in uh, the church of a uh, U.S. church uh, right now? Based on the Vietnamese Federation, in which I'm a part of that um, organization for many years, uh, I'm the um, in the country of uh, with the youth. We estimate that we have more than 850 Vietnamese priests serving in the United States. Um, I don't know exactly the number of the people and the priests ordained in the United States, but we have that estimate. And we have so many young Vietnamese priests ordained, particularly every year you can, you can see the list, 30, 40 from religious order, from the diocese. Um, so uh, we're very proud to say we have so many members of priests serving in the United States. And also, for me, it's very sad uh, to see that the the bishop, the American Bishop Council, haven't recognized the talents of the Vietnamese priest in the United States. Um, so, if we have a voice, I will fight for it, and I'm fighting for many years. When you said that you want to have a voice, what issue that? haven't been recognized and you feel like that a lack of um, recognition there and you want to fight for in the bishop uh, national bishop conference uh, you have to have the voice which means you have, have members as a member you have to become bishops and many of them are qualified and many of them um, I, I think that beyond qualified um, to be able to serve uh, as a bishop so that they can share their common views or voice and only them be able to know about the issue of the Vietnamese communities in the United States. You could have a report, reports, but reports. No right to vote. Oh, you're not a bishop, you know. You know the right to vote, but again, it's not the issue. But I just raise the concern that um, until when that uh, we'll be able to recognize. Now we have only one Vietnamese bishop, Bishop uh, Dominic Martin Lung, actually Bishop of uh, Orange. But I'm not in the political to do that. But I just say they should have more members. But I'll go back home. Uh, you may have still have some. Uh friends or some people you went to seminary with um, uh, and have you go back to Vietnam and what kind of freedom they have there to be able to serve God and serve the community uh, in Vietnam? I went back to Vietnam many times. 
um, the first trip I went back to Vietnam, I still remember when my parents came to the United States on the ODP, Order Departure uh, Program, when, when the fishing with my dad, and was talking with my dad about the stories, memories, and somehow my dad said, um, I vow that I will not return back to uh, North Vietnam. I said, you vowed not to return to your home, the motherland? He said, well, because the communists killed uh, my father, which means your grandfather. Um, my grandfather would uh, be able to bring the food to the pris in prisons and they captured my grandfather and killed him until now my father could not find his body and he accepted that so because of that he vowed well get to my heart so somehow I find a means to invite him to go back to Vietnam with uh, charities works and start with uh, Mm -hmm. Starting with um, fixing the church, being the church, um, many churches that they have no priest to celebrate mass for 40 years, 50 years. So we go back to all the old parishes like that and then charities. And I use all my vacation uh, every year to go there for two weeks, three weeks, something like that. To be able to do um, religion, especially uh, religion in Vietnam, in the service, seem to be very, um, very crowded. I mean, for example, Catholic Church, you have thousands of people go to church, right? But it's not a freedom uh, of religion. Maybe you have a lot of members go to church to go to church but it's not the freedom to be able to celebrate the real meaning of the religion. I'm not talking only the Catholic, but all the religion as well. Uh, I think we cannot bury our head uh, on the ground and say we have freedom of religion. No, we are in the communist country in general, particularly Vietnam, we don't have freedom of religion. By the way, my, all my friends, study in the seminary together uh, they all get married only me in my class somehow the dummy guy this the uh, the slow guy like me become a priest father um uh, you already answered that uh, no freedom of religion but i want to go deep a little bit by I heard that uh, when you go to seminary, you have to get approved from government or step along uh, until you have got ordained. And if you got the church approved and you don't have the government approved, you cannot be a priest, was it right? I don't know. I escaped from Vietnam at the um, age of 19. I during my time, if we wanted to go back to the seminary, which uh, uh, was very rare. We have to go to a labor camp for two years. Not the prison, but to the labor camp, just to work at the uh, loud up, turning loud up. Uh, so I did not want to do that. Um, to answer all the complex question about political, how to become priest or that, I don't know. Um, but I know this. Um, we don't have to re ask permission from the government anymore. Now the bishop give them the list and inform them that these are the gentlemen who will become, we are there become priest. The bishop explained it, we have to inform. And then later on, when they assign those new ordained priests to go to different parishes to serve the local government, or the government will allow them to do it. I don't think anything agreement about 
under the table or about um, but one has to say I have to say that we don't know the inside story uh, we have to hear directly from the Vietnamese um, Bishop Council Father, I still heard about underground prison, underground nun, you know something? Well, it's not underground, it's just so much so about um, there's many priests or then I know one or two um, beloved canon with one thought so ordain bishop can allow to ordain, to ordain. Um, in the circumstances in prison uh, in special situation but there's I don't think any underground in Vietnam, really China. Again, I don't know much about Vietnam that we can get, get deeper, which is misleading information. Father, you work a lot with um, young people uh, in this country, and um, um, what do you think about them? Do you think that they care about Vietnam, they care about the community here? Uh, what did you observe? I believe they willing to die for the country. They, I believe they're willing to do anything for the home. I do believe that. But we need to be able to encourage them and provide the environment for them to do so. Um, indeed, I have worked with many Vietnamese groups and many, 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 many young Vietnamese people. And now I became a professional in many different professions. A lot of them go back home and do good charities. Um, because they know now that they are Vietnamese. They're Vietnamese. Even though they like us, American citizens, even though we live in the United States, maybe for 31 years for you, maybe for 37 years. I mean, there were some people here came here, like the couple you met yesterday left the country 65 so they still so um, all the young people out there uh, if you're Vietnamese you are Vietnamese if you hear this tip you should be proud of who you are and be able to together to do something for the motherland uh, in your profession in your abilities but don't ever say that you don't have enough time, not enough resources. Do, just do, do a little, but just do. Part of but some some will argue that well, they live here, they have to make a living here, they have to raise the family here, so far and so on. So what is the balance that you advise them to to do? To help motherland or to do something for motherland, you can do many ways. Uh, in your own religion, we are Catholic. Uh, you can pray for. You'll be able to uh, assist the people whom willing to spend two weeks, one weeks, to go to Vietnam for medical aids or to do charities. Or you yourself can go there for one week vacation. Uh, you can find the right organization like the VAHF, uh, Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation, uh, support them financially, they can do a good job. Um, you can live out the good citizen in the United States uh, to do the right thing as a citizen in this country. That also be proud of who you are, where you come from. Um, but the point of the matter is just do, just to say yes to life, uh, not to say excuses or blaming the institution, your parents, your family or communities, just do. Uh, you, we can do so much. I, I have seen many people do many things in their limited of uh, their time or their finance, but they they so happy. If they can do it, 
you can do it. Father, um, one question. That uh, do you want to say anything to the young people out there, Vietnamese, Vietnamese American, or Vietnamese uh, or American Vietnamese descent? Uh, that they need to do anything good for their life, or what? What should they focus on? Focus on education. You can have so much money. You can have so many stores or shops. But man, if you don't have the basic education of a solid for foundation in this country, they twist you like they does anyway. Um, I have a parish, it's not a parish, but I know the guy in Las Vegas. I met him about three months ago. He's a real story. Uh, he lost about up to five million dollars on gambling. He's been in this. Uh, he shared with me that the certain casino, I would mention them, treat him like the king. Invite him to go to certain places that nobody else be able to enter. Because he played every hand $80,000, $50,000. He's a, he's a professional in one particular profession. But the point of the matter is, he said, when he lost all that money, even though he still have that card, the membership card, they not even say hi to him. The same people who treated him like a king, because they knew that he's broke. So don't think that the secular world will treat you like a king forever, if you have money and spend money on them or for them. So education then. Uh, you have it for life. That will call you doctor if you became a doctor for life. If you became a priest, they will call you priest. You kiss the deck forever for life. Or teachers or whatever profession will have the solid uh, education and you make it. Um how you identify yourself as? Are you a Vietnamese? Are you Vietnamese American? Are you uh, American? I'm very proud to say that I'm Vietnamese. Um, I always Vietnamese. I'm the Vietnamese American. I know the difference between American and Vietnamese. Uh, but I am Vietnamese. I live in the United States. I'm an American citizen. So I'm a Vietnamese American. I'm a good citizen, I believe, in this country. I believe uh, the full philosophy in this country. But uh, if you ask me the question, I just say, I'm the Vietnamese American. So what do we take? We can debate for a long time that you're American, you're the United States. Uh, I went through all many debates for that. Father, what you want to say, and I didn't ask you yet, and you want to share, especially with young people? Uh, if uh, for my own profession, I'm very proud to say that I'm very happy as a as a priest. Um, I never fire boring life, uh, or boring day in my life as a priest. So if you want to become a priest, talk to your parents. If you become a priest, uh, talk to a priest in your local parish. It's a very challenging life a very meaningful life and a very rewarding life. Um, so, um, be become what you are and what you want to become. But whatever you do, uh, do from the heart. And don't be afraid and don't ever give up. Hmm? You want to ask something? Yeah, awesome. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. I have a question for you. <clears throat> when I was in Vietnam as, okay. a, as a GI, I was 22 years old. 
and I was in combat and being shot at. I can't imagine what a 16, I mean, you lived it. Did you, did you see, did you feel the war where you were, when you were a young man? And I mean, I was scared to death. I live in the uh, um, military base. Mm -hmm. My dad, I mean, I remember that I live in, in Nguyen Chi Phuong, um, is in the Chai Quân Y, Red Cross military base. From that, they have Quân Bao, they have so many other branches of military. In the parish itself, the military parish. I see the, the uh, rocket over the head of the house from, one, from point A to Z. Um, now the 68s, we the Vietnamese always go to the grandparents' house for New Year. I remember that they attacked the Tân Sinh, uh, Binh Hoa's airport and carry my sister run from one place to another. Uh, I see people die in front of me. Uh, people just left one house and that house exploded. So. Yeah, I've seen all that. Um, so I always wonder about wondering about how the chaplain in the military serve the soldiers. So in the United States, before I became a priest, uh, I asked to join the Air Force as a chaplain candidate. And I've been trained two bases, one from Langley Air Force Base, and the other one is second assignment in um, George Air Force Base in San Bernardino. So I learned a lot about the military wives, especially the Navy wives, how they cope with their husband, go six months away, a family six months away. I cope with the soldier, how I get so panicked before the ship out to Kuwait and later on many places. Uh, so I have learned. Uh, I enjoy it. I love um, the, the chaplain, um, especially chaplain in the United States, but again, I love the Paris life more. So compare the two lives. I did compare first time of my life. I think this one is a good life. Financial would be great, but this one is more meaningful for me. Yes, you were in refugee camp when you were 19 years old. Um, can, can you tell me about how uh, it was in the refugee camp, and I know that later you came back to uh, volunteer to help those refugees. It was hard. Uh, as the uh, young man take care of the younger sister, you know, my parents sent my two um, take care of my younger brother and sister. My older sister kept take care of my younger, younger sister. You know, things like that, go to escape was hard. I remember that we have no money, of course. So I, there was the ex soldier asked me to go to the jungle and drop the goods and so that I could sell for money. I had to climb to the third mountain because the first two mountains already, the old tree took from the refugee for years ahead. And then I remember to cut them down, roll them back from the mountain, top mountain down to the sea, and push them all the way from that, whatever the angle, to the camp. And later on, drop them to the square to sell them for $7. But on that trip, I uh, almost lost my life. The shack almost went after me. But the part of matter is so funny, I saw the one square of wood we make two square and we divide it to two. My seven Malaysian dollars equal three dollars and a half, equal three American dollars and a half. I give to my sister a first dollar. I get myself a second dollar to buy cigarettes. <laughs> the third dollar buy two spoons. Because the Muslim, they don't, they don't eat spoons. You know? And then the half dollar buy noodles. So it was so funny, but that's the, young man first time make money in the refuge again. <laughs> and one day I look over the sea in which you can see a painting I painted in my office. Uh, I said one day if I make it successful I return to, to help the refugee people and I did. I did as a young priest in 1991 
uh, as a seminary Jew, I gather all my pennies, went to Philippines, um, went to uh, Palawan, Bataan, and Delila with Sister Jew and helped with them a little bit. Uh, I did went to um, Malaysia and then planned to go to Indonesia, but broke. No more money returned to Malaysia, returned to Singapore, where they stayed my friends and helped the refugee. Uh, it was a vacation, it's not really sacrifice to help, but I did a little part of that. Uh, I always want to find the means to do every summer like that, until my spiritual director said, Quan, there are great things, but you have to watch that if you don't rest, you will burn out. So I did that for eight years, a different project every summer. Uh, it was very meaningful. Nice to do in different ways. Can you tell us the story of being a very big bill guy, how you help the people of refugee over there get through the paperwork? Well, for me, my part is uh, I focus on the leaders, so I help the leaders, the volunteer, uh, so they're, they're more emotional, they're so weak. So I really support them with emotional, spiritually, and then um, from there, whatever I can do, I don't do paperwork works that the volunteers do, but I just be with them, just to be with them that give them hope. A uh, lot of them came and recognized me, said, you know, just to see you being there and help us or not, uh, give us the, the vision that one day I will be in the freedom country, the Father Quang settled down and I will be like him. So that's a great rewarding. I still remember one of the, uh, uh, how do I say that? Gà trống gọi là gì ha? Oh, the rooster. Uh, the rooster. Uh, whatever the rooster is not a rooster, but like, anyway, it's chicken. Uh, the way that the chicken crawl every day, eight hours or ten hours a day, sound like one have to kill oneself when we hear the rooster crawl like that. Is go, Janet, oi, oi, sound like that. Janet, oi, oi, that stupid rooster keep screaming like that for hours a day. So I preach about that. But anyway, the people, I think even the rooster crying out loud, the suffering of the people who went through, lost the country, escaped, left everything behind, lost the loved ones in the sea. White in the refugee camp, know, know nothing about the future. And when they, the, the part that I feel so sad and they have, I'm still mad at the system and because I couldn't do much. That we have no way to help the Vietnamese refugee people to integrate. Not to the larger society, but to integrate with one another as a husband and wife, separate for 20 years, 10 years integrate between the parents and the children separate for 10 years, 20 years, integrate in terms of understanding. Um, like in this particular parish, people came from different parts of countries and settled out here and nobody integrate their how to work together, understand each other. Because remember in Vietnam, uh, different locations have different ways to serve and to do things and they're coming together very important among the Vietnamese, even though they're Vietnamese, and nobody to help them to do that. That's why they fight most of the time, because they don't understand why my parents worship God that way for years, why they're telling us it's wrong, you know? So therefore, that, that struggle with me for now, for years until now, somehow we don't have enough personnel to do that. I think one other, this is, sure. this, this film that we're producing mm -hmm. is aimed at second generation Vietnamese, but I think um, it should also be highly uh, marketed towards uh, Americans that, that, I mean, that are, you know, didn't have to go through what the Vietnamese had to go through. To, to come here, but I think it's very important for both 
to see this, to understand what happened. Oh, would you want to say that thank you, truly thank you to to this wonderful country that really open arms and welcome us. I hope that the Vietnamese will be able to do the same to all the nation, to all the nationalities. Uh, we tend to take care of each other, the Vietnamese, tend to take care of one another so well, but we haven't reached out to the United States to help all the nations and nationalities in the real right ways, meaningful way. Uh, yeah, we, we have done some, very little, a tsunami or that we send money, but it's not about go out there to help, to build the country. We have received so much. To the American, uh, we say thank you. It's just, uh, nothing to forgive, you know. Um, not a part of life. We're moving on, moving forward. Um, to continue to teach your children right, we tend to, A, we tend not allow the school teacher to teach your children. We not allow uh, the real educator to teach your children right. They don't be afraid to teach, to discipline, and to do the right thing. So if you watch this film, continue to pray for one another and uh, continue to move forward. <laughs>